Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Today we are going to look in depth at another innovative space company. Firefly Aerospace was founded in January 2014 on the principle of simplest soonest. They say their name comes from watching fireflies at night, but I think someone might have been a science fiction fan. Firefly tries to utilize commercial off-the-shelf components to construct, among other things, this. This is the Firefly Alpha. This is a two-stage RP-1 rocket that Firefly plans to use in the commercial small sat market. The company was founded by Dr. Tom Markusik, PJ King, and Michael Bloom. Dr. Markusik holds a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton University. He has worked at SpaceX, where he was a principal propulsion engineer, Blue Origin, where he was the director of the Texas test site, and Virgin Galactic. Prior to that, he was a propulsion engineer for NASA and the U.S. Air Force. This gentleman will definitely know his rockets. Firefly was first founded as Firefly Space Systems and was self-funded by these three men. Not long after it was created, it moved its headquarters from Hawthorne, California to Cedar Park, Texas, an Austin suburb, and purchased 215 acres of land in Briggs, Texas, 50 miles north of Austin, to build a test facility. Firefly purchased the fiber winding equipment needed to make composite cryogenic propellant tanks and tested these tanks at the Marshall Space Flight Center in mid-2014. Their rocket design was revealed publicly and they planned to be cash flow positive by 2018. They signed an agreement for launch facilities with Space Florida. The Firefly Rocket Engine Research 1, or FRER-1, was tested successfully in 2015, and a flight test was planned in 2016. Then disaster struck. One of Dr. Markusik's former employers, Virgin Galactic, sued claiming he had illegally provided Virgin Galactic intellectual property to the Alpha rocket team. Understand that this is a common practice in industry. When you work at a company and develop new methods of doing things, that company owns the patent and intellectual property rights to that design. That doesn't mean that they own your brain or your ability to apply your knowledge to similar problems at other companies. Otherwise, we would suffer a state of intellectual servitude where we could never move to a new company in the same industry. It is extremely unlikely that there is any unique technology used on Virgin Galactic's horizontally launched hybrid hydroxyterminate polybutadiene nitrous oxide powered spaceship 2 discussed in this lesson that would be very applicable to a vertically launched RP-1 and liquid oxygen powered two-stage rocket. If that is the case, then why might a large company sue you when you leave their employ? The answer is to inhibit competition. Both Virgin Orbit and Firefly Aerospace will be competing for small mass satellite launches. When you have billions of dollars, you can harass the competition with lawsuits and hopefully shut them down. This may be why Blue Origin tried to patent a 50-year-old Soviet idea landing rockets vertically on an ocean platform, then sued SpaceX for having built one. Blue Origin has no drone ship to land on, and it tried hard to make sure SpaceX wouldn't either. Blue Origin lost their lawsuit, but Virgin Galactic succeeded in scaring away a major European investor in Firefly. This caused Firefly to have to furlough its entire staff in 2016. I'm not trying to say that Virgin Galactic did anything illegal, or Blue Origin for that matter. Using the legal system to harass and inhibit competition is a fact of life in corporate America. I'm saying that the deck was stacked against Dr. Markusik, and there does not seem to be any legitimate crossover in technology. Dr. Markusik is a propulsion engineer. There is nothing revolutionary about the Virgin Galactic hybrid engine that would be easily applicable to Firefly's vehicles. In the end, Firefly ran out of money to fight, and the company shut down operations. This had to be a devastating event for Dr. Markusik and the other founders, as well as all the employees. But all was not lost. This man is Max Polyakov. Mr. Polyakov is from Ukraine and seems to know a good idea when he sees one. He has successfully invested in internet companies as well as cloud-based testing and other innovations. He was the first entrepreneur to have a company listed on the London Stock Exchange when his company, Cupid PLC out of Scotland, filed for an initial public offering. Mr. Polyakov bought all of Firefly's assets at auction and seems to have combined his finance and marketing genius with Firefly's engineering to rebuild the company under the name Firefly Aerospace. Remember you don't lose until you quit fighting. Mr. Max Polyakov committed himself to funding Firefly through the first two launches, 
The design of the rocket engine to be used on the Alpha rocket was upgraded from its previous design with an expander cycle to a tap-off turbopump engine. These are now named Reaver, coincidence again I'm sure, allowing a higher mass propellant flow and therefore higher thrust. Multiple hot fires have been completed and the second stage will have a lightning engine, also successfully tested. Mr. Polyakov opened a research and development center in Dnipro, Ukraine. This facility now has the largest 3D printer in Ukraine. In 2018, Firefly partnered with York Space Systems. York Space Systems is out of Colorado. Got you, didn't I? York Space Systems has dedicated itself to creating affordable and reliable spacecraft. They have a satellite platform called S-Class. This is a three-axis stabilized satellite bus that is adaptable to Earth observation and weather, as well as communications and constellations. These mass-produced buses are planned to allow York to produce a satellite in only 30 days. With its expanded facilities in Denver, it plans to work on hundreds of satellites at once. The S-Class by York is being used by Intuitive Machines to develop the first lunar communication satellite. This satellite will be launched in 2022 to provide communications for a lunar South Pole mission. Intuitive Machines plans to land a robotic craft also into a crater on the lunar South Pole. There it will deploy a rover and drill for ice. Now back to Firefly. The Firefly Alpha is a carbon fiber composite rocket. It is 29 meters tall with a diameter of 1.8 meters. The first stage is 18.8 meters tall. Let's start at the bottom with four of the Reaver 1 engines. Here are some of the views of these engines for scale. These burn liquid oxygen and RP-1 or refined kerosene. These engines have a specific impulse of 295.6 seconds and produce 736.1 kilonewtons of thrust total, or 184 kilonewtons each. These engines use a tap-off instead of a pre-burner again to power the turbo pumps. They have nozzle-mounted turbine exhaust manifolds, seen here, and hydraulic actuators. Since there are four of them, they can be thrust vectored with a single gimbal axis. These engines have a crossfire injector system with electrically actuated trimmable main valves for throttle control. The upper stage or lightning engine uses the same propellant. It has a horizontal turbo pump with a turbine exhaust cooled nozzle system optimized for vacuum operation. It has a specific impulse of 322 seconds and a thrust of 70.1 kilonewtons. It will be able to place 1,000 kilograms into a low Earth orbit or 630 kilograms into a sun synchronous orbit for about $15 million per launch. The payload capacity is three times more than the Electron rocket by Rocket Lab at only twice the price. Here we see the connectors allowing the ground support equipment to interface with the spacecraft through the transport erector and on through to the payload and avionics package. Note that it has RS-422 and Ethernet connectors. Keeping things simple keeps the cost down and is important for staying competitive. Let's go through the components of this rocket system in depth. Here we see a dry mass of 2,895 kilograms for the first stage and 909 kilograms for the second stage for a total dry mass of 3,804 kilograms. Let's start down here at the bottom again. The first stage starts with the four Reaver 1 engines. Remember these are bigger than they look here. This is the fuel tank. It is made of carbon composite materials. The tank is holding RP-1 or refined kerosene at MEOP 80 PSI. That stands for mean expected operating pressure of 80 pounds per square inch. Remember that normal atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7 PSI. That means the pressure in this tank is about five and a half atmospheres. This would be about 550,000 pascals. Here we see the stage one helium tanks. These are used to pressurize the fuel and liquid oxygen tanks. These are carbon overwrapped pressure vessels with an aluminum liner. The aluminum prevents the gas from leaking out of the carbon fabric and the carbon covering keeps the tank from rupturing the aluminum. Pressure in these tanks is 5,500 PSI or 374 atmospheres. The gas in these tiny spheres must be at this pressure to keep these big tanks at their operating pressures. Here are the stage one avionics. And here we see the power supply and distribution unit. Here is the solenoid drive. A solenoid is an electromechanical actuator. These are used to open valves and move things. Here is the data acquisition chassis and lithium polymer batteries. These are rechargeable and have an exceptionally low mass for batteries. Going up, we have the stage one liquid oxygen tank, which is at the same pressure as the fuel tank. Then we have an interstage, which with the second stage makes up another 5.75 meters of the rocket's height. The interstage is carbon composite also, and houses the massive nozzle needed for the vacuum-optimized lightning engine. There are helium tanks here to pressurize the fuel and oxygen tanks of the second stage here, 
and here. At the same pressure as the first stage tanks. Here you can see the stage 2 a liquid oxygen tank for scale. The second stage has the flight computer, communications antennae, GPS and inertial measurement units, and the power conditioning and distribution unit, and another solenoid drive. It has the data acquisition chassis, telemetry transmitter, more batteries, and the flight termination system. Finally, we have the payload segment. This makes up the last 5.2 meters of the rocket. It starts with the payload attached fitting that it says is compatible with a 937 clamp band, which you see here. Here is the standardized secondary payload adapter. It has six ports for CubeSats to be deployed. And last, the carbon composite payload segment. Here you see one for scale. This protects the main payload during flight through the atmosphere. Finally, the fairing has a pneumatic low shock fairing separation system. Once we are out of the atmosphere, it is thrown away. As you can see in this flight profile graphic, pneumatic systems use pressurized gas to move things instead of pressurized liquid like hydraulics. After launch, the rocket will experience G-force stress. Here is the flight profile again, and here we see an acceleration curve in G's. We'll try to superimpose these. Each number denotes 9.81 meters per second squared acceleration. We see that the maximum is about 6 G's just before main engine cutoff. The full flight to orbit takes less than 500 seconds, which is about 8 minutes. Now we have a good understanding of the Alpha launch vehicle. So far about $100 million has been invested in this rocket. But there is also a Beta rocket planned. The Beta will be bigger, at 46.7 meters tall. That's not quite twice as big as the Alpha. It will have a diameter of 3.7 meters for both stages, and it will have a 4.7 meter fairing. Beta will also be propelled by RP-1 and liquid oxygen. The first stage will be powered by five Reaver-2 engines, producing a thrust of 4,261 kilonewtons which means each Reaver 2 will produce 852 kilonewtons. These have a specific impulse of 334 seconds in vacuum, but these are first stage engines, so they will have less efficiency at sea level. The second stage will have one Reaver 1 vacuum optimized engine, producing 194 kilonewtons of thrust at 325 seconds specific impulse. This will be able to get 8,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, or 5,800 kilograms to sun synchronous orbit. There is talk of making a Beta 3, Similar in design to the Falcon Heavy, it would use three beta first stages to get even more payload to orbit. There is more. This is the Gamma space plane. If this thing makes it to space, someone will finally have flown an aerospike engine. The Firefly Alpha was originally planned to have an aerospike, but when it was redesigned after the restructuring, this was removed and replaced with a standard nozzle. Aerospikes are efficient at sea level and in space, but investors never want you to do something totally new. Here is the inside of the Gamma. Here you see the first stage aerospikes. An aerospike is a cone surrounded by the engines. The exhaust plume uses the surface of the aerospike like the inside of a nozzle. But unlike nozzles that must be optimized for sea level operations or space, the aerospike works perfectly in both. Here we see the cross-fed second stage engine. Cross-fed means it can get liquid oxygen from these side tanks. These are the first stage liquid oxygen tanks. They seem to be second stage liquid oxygen tanks too. Here we see the payload fairing and a 5,000 kilogram payload. It says the payload adapter is 62 inches. That would be 5 foot 2 inches or just a little more than 1.5 meters. The Gamma is reported to be 75% reusable, though I can't see here what might get thrown away. Presumably this would launch vertically or by airlift and land horizontally. They report plans for hypersonic transport as well as satellite deployment. Firefly also has lunar aspirations. Here we see its lunar lander which is called the Blue Ghost. Blue Ghost, by the way, is a rare species of firefly. It will have several configurations and can carry 50 kilograms to the lunar surface, with plans of increasing this to 155 kilograms. It can provide a 2 kilobit per second uplink and up to 10 megabit per second downlink. These solar panels will provide power to your payload in transit and on the lunar surface. Firefly won a NASA contract to deliver up to 10 payloads to the moon. This is part of the Commercial Lunar Payload Services or CLPS program. The contract is for $93 million to send payloads to Mare Crisium, which is here, with missions lasting at least two weeks. Firefly had originally partnered with Israel Aerospace Industries to use their bare sheet design for a lander called Genesis, but decided to create an entirely new design instead, as bare sheet was too small for NASA's needs. That means we have the company Astrobiotic, Intuitive Machines, 
Mast and Space Systems, and Firefly, all landing payloads on the moon over the next couple years. NASA seems to be serious about researching the moon. Then we have this. This is the Space Utility Vehicle by Firefly. This is similar to the Photon by Rocket Lab. The Space Utility Vehicle, or SUB, can deploy multiple CubeSat payloads. It has its own propellant tank and propulsion system, as well as a solar array for power. Here you see the separation band, where the main satellite payload is attached. The SUV is a little less than 1 meter in diameter and half a meter tall, or 39.3 inches by 18 inches for my American friends. It is made of carbon fiber with a dry mass of 130 kilograms. It uses xenon propellant stored in a carbon overwrap pressure vessel here. It has a 0.4 to 5 kilowatts of power with 1 to 4 ion thrusters, providing 30 to 310 millinewtons of thrust with a specific impulse of 1,150 to 1,800 seconds. This SUV can help to get 550 kilograms to geosynchronous orbit, or up to 450 kilograms to the moon if launched from Florida. As you can see here, this does take a while, as the thrust is extremely low. We are extremely glad to see that Dr. Markusik did not let life beat him down, and went on to continue building these amazing space vehicles. That's enough for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon or the Academy Store if you can. There are links in the description. Until next time, at Astro Proterra.